Hey, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Erin Kim. I'm a hospitalist over at the VA, and I'm in charge of the division's visiting professor task force. So, of course, we have the curbsiders here. Um, I'm going to introduce them in just a second, but I wanted to mention they had an episode come out yesterday that actually has our own Dr. Moni Amin and Dr. Meredith Trubit hosting, so listen to that for sure. Um, but um, we have Dr. Wadden um, on the left there. He's an internal medicine nerd, um, clinician educator, and podcaster. He's a co-host, co-founder, and co-showrunner of The Curbsiders. Um, his academic interests include addiction medicine, digital scholarship, and faculty development. And then he loves running donuts, soccer, and reading paper books. Um, next to him is Dr. Paul Williams. Um, he's a primary care internist and clinician educator. His academic interests include addiction medicine and the intersection of social media and medical education. He's a co-host of The Curbsiders and remains bewildered at the opportunities that this has afforded him. Um, outside of medicine, he enjoys running, reading, almost exclusively fiction, and um, music and movie snobbery. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having us. So we're just going to just do the podcast as if uh, no one's here, but uh, <laughs> we might ask for applause at certain points, especially when we introduce our guest. Um, and Paul, uh, can you uh, advance the slide, please? Sure. <laughs> nope. <laughs> sure can, Matt. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this sorted before we. Yeah, we can do. So you work on the comedy, I'll work on this. No, I need, I need you here to uh, try to make right. you laugh. OK. All right. So uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, uh, we always start the show with bad jokes. So you know, Paul, um, the other day, I put my Atlanta baseball cap on the periodic table. T tell me why you did that. Or why we're doing this. So Paul, you, you can't say that I'm afraid to brave the elements. Yeah, I, I hope the audio picks up the groans from the crowd. Um. <laughs> One more, Paul. No. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Paul, the life of a red blood cell is futile. Mm -hmm. Because they live their life in vain. <laughs> it's not bad. Not bad. Okay. Not bad. All right. So uh, welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Frank Watto, here with my great friend and America's primary care physician, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Paul, how are you doing? Uh, it's, this is always awkward and painful as always, Matt, but otherwise I'm doing great. Thank <laughs> you. How are you? This feels totally natural. Uh, I usually, I pretend I'm always on air doing a show. Uh, we have a great guest today. We're going to be talking about the inpatient management of sickle cell disease. And before we tell everyone about our guest, Paul, can you remind people what do we, what do, we do on the curbsiders? Happy to remind you, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. I hope you're impressed I did it without reading it this time. I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. No, no mistakes that Thank I you. could. Uh, well, I'm probably going to make some mistakes reading the bio, <laughs> but I'll, I'll do my best. Our guest today is Dr. Yumi Shin. Applause. There you go. <laughs> uh, after completing medical school at VCU, she moved south to Emory for internal medicine residency, joined the faculty as a hospitalist at Emory Midtown in 2014, wears many hats there uh, in the division and at the hospital. Um, she's the associate site director for hospital medicine at Emory Midtown, serves as the co-associate division director for recruitment, onboarding, and retention, and lastly, the medical director of clinical documentation and the co-medical director for care coordination. She has two young boys who keep her very busy, and uh, in her free time, uh, she lives a real suburban life, which includes browsing the aisles of Target and Costco, which I imagine many people can relate to. Um, so with that, uh, please give it up for our guest, Dr. Yumi Shin. Hello, guys. Yumi, thank you for joining of us. Of course, and thank you. As always, first question has got to be, tell the audience a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine. Um, so, as you guys already heard, I love going to Target and Costco. I already heard that you went to Target here in Atlanta, got to visit already. Yeah, we should probably get this on air. Audience, I, I came down here, I forgot to bring any pants, so I went to a Target, and Moni tells me it was the good Target. It was a good Target. The best. 
It yeah, a good I, I feel like there has to be a Target sponsorship here. So there is, <laughs> for people who have not come here, there is such wild enthusiasm for Target in this place. I've never seen anything like it. We not love Target. Yeah, I mean, we love I mean. Target. They have everything that you need. You know, my children love going there. They have a huge variety of toys, which we have to get every single time we go. <laughs> I have to repeat, this is not sponsored. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> Candles, I mean, throw pillows, just so many unnecessary things. You go in for shampoo and you come out with $200 worth of unnecessary stuff. And so, so that's really, you know, how I live my life. It's very appropriate that we're stuck on the financial disclosure <laughs> slide right now. I swear Target is not a sponsor, but if Target wants yeah. to sponsor us, that would I mean, be very on brand for, for my DMs are yeah, open. My family, yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, we are gonna ask you a little bit more. Paul, what do you what are you would you like to ask our guest? Um, I think why don't we do the advice or feedback? And it could be either advice or feedback that you've gotten or that you'd like to give learners that you think would be helpful. Yeah, I feel like when I was first starting off in hospital medicine, young faculty, I didn't know what to do, right? People are always like, find a clinical niche and, you know, develop upon that. But I really didn't feel like I had a niche or anything. Um, and so I remember my first mentor saying, you know, for the first couple of years, just say yes to everything. All right. You want to join a committee? Yes. You want to write this paper with me? Yes. And I really feel like that opened up a lot of opportunities for me and really brought me to where I am in my career today. Um, and so now I'm at a point where I can say no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, say yes for a couple of years. Try to find, you know, what brings you joy and what kind of your niche is. And then when, once you start to find that, you can start to say no at times. So I I literally watch Paul go through that same thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's something I struggle with a lot because I feel like it, there's a lot of enthusiasm to tell people to say no to things, which yes. is great if you already know exactly what you want to do with your life. Yes. I was completely undifferentiated out of residency. All I knew is I want to be a doctor. And then once I was a doctor, Matt and I talked about this all the time. I was like, uh-oh. Because <laughs> now what am I supposed to do? So I, I so saying the yes was the thing we find my interest. So I, I love that advice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's when I started freaking out when I realized that like my only goals were like become a doctor, start a family. Those things were done at a very young age, and I was just like, all right, now I got to figure out what I'm going to do. So apparently, podcasting. I, imagine my family doing those things at an older age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you both figured it out. All right, so let's let's do some quick picks of the week. Uh, you mean, do you have a pick? of the week that you would like to um, share with the audience? Yes, I'm going to bring you back kind of nostalgia. Um, there's a new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie out, Mutant Mayhem, all right? And my kids are now four and six. And they're both boys, and so they're super into Ninja Turtles. We went to go watch it in the theaters. It's like really kind of this retro, kind of comic-y feel. Um, and it really brought me back to my childhood since I feel like everything kind of comes back around, right? Yes. And so Ninja Turtles are back. They are all over Target, all right? We, were, we bought all the Ninja Turtles and all of their swag. Um, and it's a really good movie, so you guys should watch it. I think my kids recently watched that with, with their friends and, and did enjoy it. Yeah. I, I'm more of a fan of the original Turtles movies from the probably <laughs> 90s. I don't know. It's such Way a weird hipster when. sentiment. Like, I, I like the original Turtles. I like that. <laughs> All right, Paul, what's your pick of the week? No, I think there might be a theme going on here. So that my pick of the week, I'm actually, I just watched uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse um, two nights. I've seen a lot of aggressive head nods, which is great. <laughs> like it came out at the gangbusters box office. I've heard no one talk about it. And I just watched on demand a couple of nights ago and I just blown away. It is maybe the most beautiful movie I've ever seen. If not, certainly the top three. It's like, you know how in comic books, since you're stuck with sort of aesthetic pictures, all the sort of tricks they do to kind of, show the illusion of motion so they translated that back to something that actually moves and it makes it even more dynamic and beautiful the art style changes depending on characters and the characters mood like the whole thing is just beautiful but also compelling and, and fun to watch so i recommend spider-man across the spider-verse all right i'm gonna i'm gonna quick recommendation for the, and i'm late to this that espn has a great app because if you I, I now watch soccer paul which i've talked to you about a bunch mm -hmm. and like champions league is happening oh there's the german the spanish the english league and there's so many games every day the, the, espn, <laughs> the espn app just has like it's amazing like it'll show you the lineups it'll show you who scored who got cards it's it's the best way to follow it all uh and it's it's a free app so so download the espn app uh or whatever sport you like i'm sure i'm sure it's good for that too um but Paul, let's, for time's sake, let's get on to a case from Cashlack, and uh, you, you start us off. Surely. So, and everyone can hear us okay? Okay, all right. More aggressive head nods, great. We may or may not have done a grand rounds where the audience couldn't hear us. Not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you want to advance the slide as well, Paul, I mean, because that, so the audience can follow along with the case. Uh, we already did that part. There we go. Okay, all right. All right, so we're going to talk about CC. 
who is a 28 year old female with sickle cell disease who presents to the ED with acute pain in her shoulders, hips, and back, consistent with prior pain crises. She has mild tachycardia, her temp is at 99 degrees, her stats are 96%, she appears uncomfortable, but she's awake and alert. Hemoglobin is 7.5 from a baseline of 8 to 9. Her ticks are 6%, which is up from 2.5%. LDH is 275, and for reference, normal range is 105 to 233. Creatinine is 1.2, BUN is 22. At home, she takes oxycodone IR 10 milligrams every four to six hours for severe pain, but not, not routinely, not on the clock. So before we even get too deep into the case and how you would manage this kind of thing, I would just like to hear sort of how this compares to sort of the prototypical patient that you see when you're admitting someone for, for pain crisis. Yeah, this is a pretty typical case that we might see in the emergency room, right? Um, and so history is pretty important to take, and we've already gotten some good information about this patient. I want you to remember back way back into medical school when we're when we're learning about sickle cell disease. And remember, there are like three main types, right? And it really depends on the type of beta globin gene that's like expressed within the patient. Um, and so this this um, the main three types are like SS disease, SC disease, and sickle trait. And we know that this patient is coming in with SS disease. And that's the type of patient that we might see a lot more commonly in the emergency room setting and in the inpatient setting as that's the most severe form, right? And so just looking at this patient's case, it looks like they're coming in with basal occlusive crisis, which is the most common reason that patients will come into the emergency room. And it accounts for about 95% of our inpatient admissions. Okay, so it's pretty common, right? Um, we start to look at their vital signs and look at their labs and kind of see what the patient looks like and kind of see how sick they are, right? And in the emergency room, they'll go ahead and start giving IV fluids and giving pain medications and actually recommendations from the American Society of Hematology are that patients get assessed and triaged and given analgesia within about 60 minutes of hitting the door. Okay. They found that early administration of analgesia has actually shown to decrease the risk of hospitalization, and so keeping them out of the hospital, and it actually leads to kind of early detection of those acute complications of sickle cell disease. Um, one of the great things that we have here in Atlanta, I don't know if you guys got to go to Grady yesterday, um, but Grady actually has a specialized um, sickle cell uh, ER where patients with sickle cell disease can go if they're feeling like they're in basal occlusive crisis. I believe it's called the sickle cell acute care center um, and so patients will go in they'll start to get their IV fluid get triage very quickly get pain medication get their labs drawn and um, really kind of assess whether they need to be admitted inpatient and really this is like the most ideal state I, I understand that not every hospital is going to have access to something like this right and we're very fortunate to have something like this in the Atlanta area for our sickle cell population but that's really you know the ideal way that you would take care of a patient is that they get seen early, they get pain medicines as fast as possible um, so that they're getting kind of on their treatment. Has anyone coined the term door to analgesia? Yeah, that's a really good it. idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, <laughs> but th this, well, it was, it was along those lines, but this seemed like in the whole pain treatment, uh, Ash has a guideline from 2020 talking about pain treatment in sickle cell. And the only part that had really strong evidence mm -hmm. was this rapid assessment like give give the medicine within an hour, I, the sooner the better, and then reassess again right. within an hour. And that really seems to keep patients out of the hospital. And right. that's why those sickle cell centers work. And there's been a, a bunch of places that have published on that. That, mm -hmm. that seemed like the, the most robust evidence for all of this. Once they get for into sure. the hospital, which we'll talk about, right. is it's a little bit more variable what happens and the guidance is much less clear. Totally. So, what do you uh, what do you what in a history do you really listen for that gets you maybe worried that you think is really important when we're taking history when patients come in with pain? Yeah, so I, I mean, we're obviously looking at what kind of, you know, sickle cell disease they have. Again, SS disease. One of the main things that I like to ask about is if they've had acute complications from their sickle cell disease before, right? If they have a history of acute chest before in the past or issues with like stroke or priapism, those are things that are going to like be like red flags in my mind that I really want to keep an eye out for. Um, and so again, you know, we always like talk about how history taking is so important, right? And we're always telling our medical students, yeah. like, get a good history, right? Um, and so it, it, it's pretty important to go ahead and get those little bits of information. It seemed like the, 
pri they put a lot of stock, I guess, at, at least anecdotally in like, does this feel like prior pain crisis? Mm -hmm. Is that like an yes. essential question? Yes, that's a big question that I ask. Like, where is your pain located? Is it kind of typical of your basal occlusive crisis pain? Mm -hmm. And most of the time patients will be able to tell you yes or no, that this feels the same or this feels different. Once it starts to feel different, you might want to have a, you know, a tiny little red flag up to say like, maybe I'm looking at something a little different, right? Did they have some sort of like a vascular necrosis that's causing them to have more pain in that area or not? Um, and so it, it's, it's pretty typical for us to ask them, you know, what is your kind of typical type of pain? Where do you feel the pain? Is it about the same? Can you talk us through some of the pitfalls of this initial pain management? So we talked about the evidence seems very strong for, for addressing analgesia very quickly. But sort of where where can we fall down? What kind of concerns arise treating pain initially? Like, I, you know, I, I feel like there's often concerns for, say, developing substance use disorders along those lines. Where where can this fall apart and how can we avoid that? Yeah, I think... Um, if you can, just a little more central. Okay, yes, sorry. perfect. <laughs> um, I think when we um, think about giving pain medicines to patients that physicians feel a little bit worried, right? They feel a little bit worried and concerned about how much pain medicine that they're giving them. Are they giving them enough or maybe they're giving them too much, right? And so we always get a little bit concerned and worried, especially if we don't have a lot of experience with giving IV pain medicines. Um, and so at that point, I would say, you know, if you're worried or concerned, go ahead and phone a friend, right? Phone your palliative care uh, medicine colleagues or phone somebody in pain management or even in pharmacy to help you say like what kind of dosages you should use or what kind of pain medicines that you should use for the patients. Um, I think there's this common misconception that patients with sickle cell disease actually have a higher use of opioid misuse or a higher propensity to have opioid overdose. And that's not really the case. Um, there was an article done, I think in the Journal of Pain Medicine that took a look at patients with sickle cell disease and patients who have kind of chronic pain illnesses and take kind of chronic opioids. And they found that there was really no difference between the two in terms of opioid um, overdose or opioid use disorder from like a general population. Um, and so I think we really need to kind of keep this kind of at the top of the mind that because we have um, this kind of misconception and they actually, I think, did some survey results that looked at healthcare professionals and their attitudes toward patients with sickle cell disease and there's a very high negative attitude towards patients with sickle cell disease, which then I think leads to a lot of undertreatment, right? That we're not treating the patients adequately for their pain, which can then make their vaso-occlusive crisis worse, which then kind of can lead to more kind of acute complications that we might see in the hospital. I, I even saw one article mention the concept of pseudo addiction due to un, a pain that was inadequately treated right. and the patient having to request more medication. But you mentioned the bias, just mentioning to some people that we were coming here to talk about this topic, they said, oh, that'll be great because all those patients have, you know, addiction. Right. And I was, and, and I was like struck by that because that's not what the evidence shows. Right. And Paul and I were talking about this and, and Paul, I'd, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, but I think it's, maybe it's a little bit of sampling bias where, because I have a bunch of patients in my outpatient panel who have sickle cell and they, they take opioids like once or twice a year when they have a pain crisis and they want to get off them as soon as possible and they're doing fine. And I think that's the majority of patients right. with sickle cell. But if you're a hospitalist and you have <clears throat> patients recurrently admitted, you're, you're seeing probably the patients that aren't doing well. And uh, maybe it's because their pain's inadequately treated or maybe they're, it, it really is one of the rare people who has an issue. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what clouds the judgment. Paul, what do you think? Yeah, it's, I was reading at this too, because of, of course I'm interested and I'm trying not to look too much like an idiot, but I am. Um, <laughs> But You're it's, doing great. It, there, thank you. I mean, it's early. We got plenty of time. But there have been case reports and studies on this, and, and patients who are undertreated for their pain crises are more likely to develop use disorder because sure. we're not doing our job treating their pain adequately. So instead, they will go out and potentially use illicits or, or self medicate with alcohol or those kinds of things. So, if anything, undertreating potentiates use disorder as opposed to concerns for overtreatment. I think, Matt, to your point, there, it's. There's a lot of confusion around tolerance, which is expected if you're giving right. someone chronic opioid medication. So if you're using doses that you yourself are not comfortable with, it's easy to sort of take that nervousness and reject it onto the patient. They're making me feel uncomfortable. And then the whole experience becomes negative for everybody. And I think that's probably what a lot of people experience. I, I, I don't want to, that's not, that's not evidence-based, that's just Paul Williams' opinion. But I think there's a big difference between use disorder and pain with, say, dependency even or uh, tolerance, which, are, which is something entirely different. Right.
Well, let's talk a little bit about, it, it seems the, especially a place that has a specialized like acute care for patients with sickle cell, most of those patients that are frequenting there have, made, it sounds like an individualized pain plan that has been come up with based on prior experience and based on what they take at home. I think what, where it becomes, you, you mentioned they get a couple doses, maybe three doses of IV push. If that doesn't work, they might get admitted. Mm -hmm. How do you, when you're receiving that patient, um, what, what is your thought process when you're crafting a regimen? Because I feel like that's yeah. where I would really fall down and not know what to do. Yeah, I think, again, if you're concerned or worried, you know, consult a friend, mm -hmm. phone a friend, and they can help you a little bit with this, right? Let's say I have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> Matt has absolutely no friends and no consults <laughs> that he can give. So I think um, kind of thinking about like a patient who comes in through the emergency room, the emergency room has done already a lot of legwork for us, right? They've already tried some pain medicines and maybe, um, you know, with this patient coming in, they take about oxycodone 10 milligrams and maybe they're giving like an equivalent dose, right, of pain medicines through the IV. Now, remember that vaso-occlusive crisis is an acute crisis, right? So patients are going to have more pain than maybe um, is going to be expected and their outpatient regimen may not work for them. And the reason that we're seeing them in the hospital is because they've tried their outpatient regimen, they've tried their PO regimen, and it's not working. So we may be needing to increase that dose when they come in. Okay, so for example, with this patient, let's say they came in through the emergency room, and they decided to give the patient like five milligrams of the IV morphine. Okay, and that's actually like pretty equivalent to the 10 milligrams of oxycodone this patient mm -hmm. is taking. So we'll go down, we'll assess the patient and if the patient says, Oh, man, like this pain regimen is not working for me. I feel like I really need to do something different as they're coming into the hospital, you may want to think about increasing that dose by about like 25 to like 50%. Okay. So like, for example, when a patient comes in, I always try to use an IV PCA dosing. For the patient, I feel like it, it's better than an intermittent bolus dosing for patients. Um, and so um, they have found that studies uh, have found that just using PCA dosing actually does help with decreasing uh, pain faster and kind of decreasing that hospitalization. And I feel like it's a lot easier for patients to just self-administer that bolus dosing that they need for, for their pain regimen. Okay, so when we're thinking about bringing this patient in and you want to increase their dose, let's say you decide on the 25%, you're going to give them, you know, six milligrams in the IV, right? And if we're going to do a PCA dosing, that's going to be their demand push, mm -hmm. okay? That's going to be how much they get. With the PCA, you can decide on how much um, to give and at what frequency, right? Like you could do a time limit in terms of how much to lock it out. So just remember that patients who take opioids, it takes about 10 to 20 minutes to get that kind of good effect of the IV opioid. I think the main kind of pitfall to think about is that um, you don't want to dose them too early because you don't want to give them too much of the opioids. Mm -hmm. And so I would say like a 15 minute lockout for them to push every 15 minutes if needed um, is like a good dose to kind of start at. Again, just because you give them the 15 minutes every 15 minutes, they're not going to push it every 15 minutes. Once they achieve good analgesia, they're going to stop pushing it every 15 minutes and maybe do 30 or an hour or a couple hours, you know, as they feel like they have pain. And if we're using those PCAs the way that we should with the correct amount of opioids, there's very little risk of overdose, okay? So when a patient is getting too much opioids, they uh, will fall asleep and they will not be able to push that button unless they have a family member who's coming and pushing that button for them, which is a big no-no, right? <laughs> yes. Um, and so they are going to be the ones that are pushing that button themselves. And so I think, you know, again, we kind of look at what they are starting at, what kind of dosage the, dosages they are on, and it has to do with a lot of reassessment and kind of seeing whether their pain is under good control. And if it's not, go ahead and increase that dose for them. Can I ask you in terms of how you, you talk to these patients when you're accepting only your service? I, I just, there's so much, I know we're, we're talking about acute pain now, but even in terms of discussions about chronic pain and a lot of that is potentiated theoretically by even just trauma within the healthcare system and the mm -hmm. stigma that you're talking about. So when you're first admitting a patient, having conversations about how you're going to manage their pain, that kind of thing. Can you just sort of talk us through what your, what your skill of the patients that are and sure. how you actually address that with them specifically? Yeah. I mean, when I go down to the emergency room, I tell them they're going to be admitted. 
that's number one, right? <laughs> Sometimes patients question. don't even know that they're going to be coming into the hospital. Um, so I let them know, and I feel like setting expectations is really important. And that's just not for sickle cell patients, that's for all patients that are coming in, right? It's setting expectations. You're going to be getting IV fluids, you're going to be getting your labs checked, um, you may or may not need a blood transfusion, um, and you're going to be getting uh, pain medicines, and we're going to try to get your pain medicines under control. I mean, I think we're unique um, at Emory Midtown, where I primarily work, where we have a co-management service with the hematologist. Um, and so his patients, um, he's been he's been practicing for many a decade. He sees a lot of patients here in the Atlanta area. His patients, he knows his patients well, they know him very well, and they know exactly what to expect when they're coming into the hospital. And so that makes it very easy for us in hospital medicine to be, you know, be like, okay, you already know exactly what you're gonna get. But I understand if you don't have a luxury like that, like we do, right? And so again, it's all about setting expectations and, and um, letting the patient know like, hey, if your pain is not under good control, just let your nurse know. We can take a look and see what your pain regimen is and we can increase the dose. And again, if you're worried about it, Get your hematologist involved, um, you know, get pain management on board if you need to, and they can really help you with that. I think uh, for, for the young people or the, or the older people in the audience, uh, the, the fact that you said, I like to tell the patient they're being admitted because they might not have been told that, <laughs> that happens so often. So often. The patient's like, wait, am I, I'm coming into the hospital or the family members are, are oh, wait, they're admitting mom or right. dad. So I right. think it's, that's a really great just. The one time I've ever been to the hospital, that's exactly what happened to me. They're like, all right, go on the stretcher, you're going up the ICU. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's not oh, really? <laughs> Um, so I, I, I think that was great. And then the, w whenever, like we talk about any patients, we've done other episodes talking about treatment of acute pain mm -hmm. and like always sort of setting expectations, having like an exit strategy. I like to have as part of that. Mm -hmm. So when you're telling a patient, I, I'm going to put you on a PCA mm -hmm. when they're, when they're leaving the hospital, we can talk about like, what's going to happen, getting them back on their home opioids if they're taking opioids. Mm -hmm. So this patient we think was just taking it maybe as needed, not around the clock. Mm -hmm. If, if they, if they were taking it around the clock, would you continue those as a base and then ha give them the demand PCA as well? No, um, I would take them off of their short acting pain medication mm -hmm. and basically you're replacing that short acting pain medicine with that IV. Form, okay. okay, so you're replacing their oral medicines and replacing it with an IV form within mm -hmm. the PCA that they can deliver to themselves. Now, if a patient is on a long acting pain medication that they take by mouth, I will just continue that for them when they're in the hospital. Okay, yeah. so if they're on a long acting oral opioid, I will go ahead and continue that unless they have some sort of contraindication where they like cannot take any PO, mm -hmm. um, I will go ahead and keep them on it. Now there's um, some thoughts about like, do you add basal dosing and like continuous PCA or not? Um, and some of the studies are mixed, but kind of overall, it looks like that basal dosing for PCAs, if the patient is not on like a long acting oral medication, doesn't actually really help in terms of pain control and like decreasing yeah. the length of hospitalization and so that's not something and it that seems I would like it would do. increase the risk because exactly. it's just like it's not if the patient falls asleep they're still getting it exactly exactly yeah so and and we talked about tolerance and withdrawal so if someone's on a long acting you just have to continue it just for right. the, their tolerance and then you're treating the acute pain with right. the pca exactly. demand dose. exactly okay i like that yeah because it it was, it was funny. They're like, we can't recommend in the guideline, we can't recommend for or against continuous <laughs> PCA. Then dosing. you're like, what do I do? <laughs> right. Right. Um, all right. And, and, and then if the patient, so you sort of have given us in, if we were lucky enough to practice in a place like where you do, the patient may already have like an individualized right. plan and a hematologist who is on board and the patient's right. on board, but we might have to do a little bit more work saying, okay, here's what we're going to do with your chronic opioids. Here's what we're going to, we're going to give you acutely. We'll mm -hmm. reassess frequently. I want you to tell me if you're in pain. So they know you're sort of working with exactly. them. I guess this would be a good time to ask, like what adjuvant things are you doing for pain? Because like all pain treatment, I think should always be multimodal. So Definitely. what other things are good to do? Um, I'm, I mean, I love NSAIDs. 
nephrologists are probably going to come after me <laughs> after this talk. Um, but I feel also like also very good for the stomach. Yes, yeah. very good for the stomach. Um, but I feel like NSAIDs work really, really well. Mm -hmm. And in the inpatient setting, we choose to use an IV form of an NSAID, so it'd be Ketorolac that we use. Um, I generally schedule Ketorolac for patients while they're in the inpatient setting, and try not to schedule it for more than three days. Okay, that's when we start to see risks and more complications like GI issues or kidney problems. Um, so I really kind of keep it at that. Um, I also like to use uh, Tylenol, again, scheduled for like 48 hours, and I feel like that also can help with uh, pain along with the IV opioids. Um, my um, interns from this like kind of last time that I was on teaching service will probably tell you that Dr. Shin loves lidoderm patches, They're like my favorite <laughs> medication. Um, I use them for my aches and pains as I near the ripe old age of 40, um, that I might need them. But I feel like it works really well for kind of that like pinpoint pain that patients may have, right? Like, oh, I'm having pain in my elbows or on my back. Um, so I like to use those. And I also like to use things like um, uh, like dicoplanac gels or like NSAID gels because I feel like those also work. So kind of a combination of those things along with the IV opioids have actually been shown to improve pain. Um, and so those are kind of in my like wheelhouse. How about thermal? Uh, yeah, heat heat therapy is great. Um, a lot of patients will even come in with their own like heating pads or their heating blankets. Um, we have like those heating kind of, um, I guess like, like bags, I don't really know what to call them, but they have those at the hospital as well. So patients can use that. Um, there's some thoughts about things like massage or like yoga or like music therapy, um, but I mean, it's kind of hard to do in the hospital. I feel like it's hard to do like yoga poses. I don't know from your bed. <laughs> um, and then like uh, music therapy. I mean, I guess you could use headphones, but not like blasting your classical music down the hall type thing. Um, so those are some other kind of non pharmacological things to think about. Oh, well, you looked like you were going to ask something. No, that was yeah, exactly what I wanted to know because all that stuff was indicated for acute pain for the ASH guidelines too. And as for those things, like my, my response, like, I mean, okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could <laughs> like, do really some, like, yoga. I don't know. Like, yeah. can you bring your massage therapist into the hospital? I'm not sure. <laughs> I did see, I think this is just good for any hospitalized patient who can do it. Uh, just ambulation, it seemed like that was oh, recommended. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, I think people are people are in bed too much um, in the hospital, not not necessarily their own fault. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's us and tying actually, around things. Yeah, yeah actually, or, uh, early ambulation has been shown to kind of decrease uh, pain and decrease the, like hospitalization, like the length of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And of course, like as a hospitalist who is all about length of stay, that's like really mm -hmm. important for us, right? So we want to make sure to treat that patient's pain and early ambulation has been shown to, to improve that. Fantastic. So I think, so we've talked about uh, what to do with the, the opioids, uh, the Mandos PCA sounds like a good way to go for most patients. If they're on long acting, we'll continue them. We'll do uh, gels and creams and patches and yeah. uh, standing, um, maybe acetaminophen, Ketorolac for patients. What, what does it look like when you're bringing them out of the hospital, that transition from the, the PCA back to their home medication? Yeah. So remember that the vaso-occlusive crisis is going to be like an acute Base, right? That patients during this time are probably going to use a lot more than they take as an outpatient, mm -hmm. right? And so we're going to talk with the patient and they're going to start to improve, right? They're going to start to feel better. Their pain levels might come down, um, that their lab work will indicate that their uh, vasoclusive crisis is improving. And so at that point, this is when, again, we're trying to set expectations like, hey, looks like things are improving for you. Um, your lab work is getting better. You know, it looks like your pain is under better control. So what we're going to do is take you off of the PCA and add you back to what you were on your home regimen. Mm -hmm. Now, they may need a little bit extra. Okay, since again, they're kind of in this acute kind of crisis that they might need a little extra than what their home dose is providing them. So um, sometimes we might add a little bit of an extra IV pain medicine for that extra breakthrough on top of that breakthrough oral. Um, and if it looks like that's that they need more than what they generally take at home, you know, that's something to counsel them on, right? Like, hey, I know you take 10, but it looks like you actually really need maybe like 15 milligrams of the oxycodone. Just FYI, I want you to know that that's what you're going to go on. But, you know, as your pain improves at home, too, you're going to start to come down on that and come back to kind of your normal dose of your um, oxycodone.
you yeah so that if we were going to do that we would need to be in touch with our outpatient prescriber because sure. they're, they're going to run into pill count problems with that but for that sure. sounds like a reasonable thing to do yeah and and so they so you wouldn't keep them on the pca and say like just use the oral as your first line and, and just sort of try to use the pca less it would, it would be the intermittent pushing yeah really i would probably just take them off of the pca because sometimes it can get a little bit kind of Using. Yeah. Um, and so as we're trying to transition them out, I would just take them right. off of the PCA kind of all together. Yeah. And this is why we wanted to talk about this because there's no, there, I didn't see any firm guidance on like no. how people do this. And I, I'm sure people, people have different strategies right. for this. So it's, it's good to hear what's, what's working here. Um, anything else uh, from this section, Paul, that you wanted to ask about like this? I, I did, and, I, and I'm not sure if this is the space to talk about this or not, but what about the patient who does not improve as you continue their, their analgesia? Like, are, as I, I think the ASH guidelines talked about using some anesthetic doses of ketamine or that kind of thing. Like, what, what options do you have for someone where you just feel like you can't achieve adequate analgesia? Yeah, um, I would not be making that call of using a ketamine, right, in the hospital. And again, this is kind of when I would start to get my pain management colleagues on board. Mm -hmm. um, and they um, have kind of a whole toolbox of different things that they might use, whether it be the ketamine for you know a few days to really kind of kind of reset that kind of pain right that they're having um, and then add back kind of a PCA and kind of taking a look at that and so I would say like if you're thinking about even reaching for something outside of what you're comfortable with definitely get to talk with some of the experts and you know talk with some of your colleagues on that I think they're if they have really localized pain, I think there's blocks and things yes. that can also be yeah. considered. Yes. And, and you don't it, want me doing a block yeah. on, on a patient. <laughs> that anesthesia world. Yeah, is, exactly. That is not lidocaine that is patch. not for us. Yeah, just a lidocaine patch. That's all I can do. Yeah. So uh, again, let's we we have uh, let, let's let's take it a step back and just like what are your just general admitting orders? Like we've talked, we've jumped right mm -hmm. to pain, but right. any any things because I, I know there's some and if maybe you could comment on. Does everyone need IV fluids and oxygen mm -hmm. and daily labs and those right. things? Yeah. Um, I have like an order set for mm -hmm. patients who are coming in with basal occlusive crisis since we see a lot of that, right? And so let's take a look at kind of what order sets that we have, right? So in our order set, we always have IV fluids. Um, I feel like people are asking me like what kind of fluids, at what rate, you know, like what do I do with those fluids? And in terms of the type of fluids, I think we were always taught in residency to do something hypotonic, right? That we're trying to do something like D5, half normal, because it's really based off of the physiology of the sickle cells that if it's like a hypotonic, tonic fluid that they won't sickle as much as if it were like an isotonic or hypotonic oh, yeah, that's, or something that's right um and so but there's no really good randomized control trial to tell me like do i use normal saline or do i use lr and it's really just based off of this like kind of physiology theory. And so I think we've just kind of perpetuated that. And unless there's a randomized control trial that'll come out um, to tell me like what kind of fluids to use, that's probably the fluid choice that I would use. Um, a lot of the literature kind of goes through things like whether we should use maintenance fluids, like do we bolus patients? And really the main thing to think about is not over flooding the patient with too much fluids. I think that's kind of where we get into trouble. If the patient is taking an adequate PO and they're, you know, a, a, Vasoclusive crisis is like pretty mild, you know, maybe we can get away with not even doing IV fluids on that patient if they're taking in good oral intake. But if they're not, right, then you want to make sure that they're on some sort of maintenance, okay? So anywhere from like 75 to like 125 cc's an hour of, you know, your, of your fluids. Um, and the main thing is to not overload them with too much. Otherwise, they can have pulmonary edema, which can then, you know, cause a risk of acute chest syndrome, which we do not want to have. Right. So our dealer's choice for fluid, right? I, I think it's it a, might be dealer's choice. I'll, I'll probably still, still use, use D5 half normal half saline, normal. you okay. know, just because of like that theory of the physiology. Um, I'll and buy so, that. That sounds yeah, good. That yeah, sounds good. Right? Um, and then the other things to think about are like oxygen therapy, right? I feel like the oxygen is like slapped on every single patient that comes into the hospital, yeah. regardless of whether you need it or not. I think really the recommendations are is if they're less than like 95% is when you might think about putting oxygen on the patient. Again, like when the patient is having a basal occlusive crisis, right? They're, they're having all these sickle cells like running around their body and it's not perfusing your tissues, right? And so when you don't have good oxygen perfusion in your tissues, you're going to have pain and that's what's creating this like basal occlusive pain crisis, right? Um, and so making sure that they're getting that oxygen if they really need it is pretty important. Um, labs, 
daily labs are, are not necessary if the patient's labs have been pretty stable. In the first couple of days, I'll still want to check labs because mm -hmm. that's kind of where they're at like the highest risk of having acute complications from their vasoclusive crisis. So for the first few days, I might go ahead and check labs daily. And that's like, you know, CBC, CMP, their LDH, their retic counts, like all the things that we've already gotten that I would check just to make sure that, you know, things are, are looking smooth. Okay, but if things are pretty stable and you know they're improving, I'm not going to check labs on them every single day. All right, hear that, audience? Uh, <laughs> daily labs. That's like definitely a one of those things that I, I've, daily labs are so hard to stop. It's like yes. so hard to get yes. people to not order I know. daily labs. I think we're just like conditioned as interns to always get labs, always yes. get labs, because our attendings are always asking us about labs, and if we don't have them, we feel like you know nervous about not having them. And so I think it's like a really important thing to think about and to stop if you can. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so that's our public service announcement. Uh -huh. uh, this has been a public service announcement by the curbsiders. Thank you. Uh, daily labs, not necessary. Brought to you by Target. <laughs> Brought to you by Target. <laughs> what else? Uh, what other things? So we talked about, so IV fluids, yep. we talked about oxygen. Mm -hmm. Oxygen's a medication. So if they're, if they're above 95%, mm -hmm. you don't need to give oxygen. Right. And then we talked about um, labs. Labs. Mm -hmm. Labs are not, daily labs for everyone every day is not necessary, mm -hmm. especially once they're stable. What else is good practice to put for right. all your patients? Um, incentive spirometry, there's actually like really good evidence to show that incentive spirometers can decrease the risk of acute chest. And so um, when a patient comes in, I feel like their incentive spirometer is like at their sink or like on the couch, like super far away. So make sure to bring their incentive spirometer close to them, show them how to use it. Have you ever tried an incentive spirometer before? No, I haven't. <laughs> they're actually I've, really I'm hard. I'm a bad doctor. I should yes. really try. <laughs> and they're actually really difficult to do. Um, and so instruct them on how to use it. You know, the nurses can show them how to use it if you don't know how to use it yourself. Um, but Inceptus spirometer actually has really good data um, to help prevent the, the complication of acute chest. Um, bowel regimens, of course, are really good to use, especially if your patient is on opioids, as that can cause constipation. Um, I feel like constipation and, like, MPO status are, like, number one complaint of all of my patients in the <laughs> hospital um, and so making sure that they have that bowel regimen um, for them and then uh, VTE prophylaxis is another thing we think about um, sickle cell disease is a thrombophilic state and so they're at higher risk of having PEs or DVTs and complications from that so making sure patients are on that and of course we talked a little bit about early ambulation already that there's really good information and some data to show that early ambulation can help kind of decrease mm -hmm. that hospitalization so for interest of time, I, I wanted to move on to the next part of the case. And we'll say um, just quickly, if, if they're on hydroxyurea, it sounds like that's a continue unless you're worried they're having some sort of yes. complication from it or yes. they're in septic shock or something. Yeah, so septic shock, if you are having some sort of major cytopenia, if you have like really bad acute kidney injury where your like uh, GFR is less than 30 are like the main times where you may not want to use hydroxyurea in the inpatient mm -hmm. setting. Otherwise, I would continue them on hydroxyurea. Oh, all right. right, let's advance the case. So what is on the next slide? I should probably know the answer to that. Right. <laughs> I think we went through those things. We're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, minute <laughs> orders. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Now we're cooking with things. All right. So because we are good doctors, we order a demand-only PCA, and so does barometry, DVT prophylaxis. We listen to you. On her third day in the hospital, the patient complains of severe chest pain and shortness of breath. Heart rate is 125. O2 stats dropped 89%. She's placed on two liters of oxygen by nasal cannula, hemoglobin is 6.5, creatinine is 1.2. So you, you get this call. What is your differential diagnosis and, and now what do we do? Yeah, so um, it looks like the patient's getting worse, right? They're more tachycardic, they're hypoxic, their hemoglobin dropped. And so like top of my mind is acute chest syndrome. Um, the acute chest syndrome is actually one of the more major and like severe complications of sickle cell disease. It's actually the most common cause of death and children and adults with sickle cell disease. And it's like the second most common reason that patients are being admitted to the hospital. Um, and so we talked about this before, where if a patient has a history of acute chest before in the past, that they're gonna have a higher incidence of having acute chest in the hospital. So it's important to kind of get that little tidbit of history um, when, when you admit the patient. It's basically a pneumonia-like illness that's acute. 
that presents like a lower respiratory tract infection, okay? So like a pneumonia. So patients are gonna have fever or cough or shortness of breath. They can have chest pain, uh, they'll be hypoxic, and you may see a new pulmonary infiltrate on chest x-ray when you check them. Um, why it's important to make sure to triage these people, uh, triage these patients quickly and make sure that you're um, putting that at the top of your differential is that these patients can progress really quickly to respiratory failure or multi-organ failure. And so you really wanna keep a close eye on them. If it looks like they're worsening and they need to be um, upgraded to a higher level of care, let's say like a step down unit or an in intensive care unit, you know, make sure to send that patient over you know, to, to the appropriate level of care. And as the patients are starting to have acute complications of sickle cell disease, this is where I'm going to reach for my hematology colleague to be, to be on board, for them to get on and say, hey, you know, how are we going to treat the patient and come up with that treatment plan together? Um, as the patient kind of develops these complications, you know, we want to continue with the management that we have going on, right? With the IV fluids and the pain medications, oxygen, um, we may want to add some antibiotics, you know, for the patient. Um, and as we're coming up on flu season, we may want to also think about antivirals, right? Because H1N1 can also kind of precipitate this. Um, and if the patient is looking like their hemoglobin is dropping, and I think the kind of the guidelines say, like if there's a one point or one gram difference from their baseline hemoglobin, you may want to consider doing like a simple transfusion. And if the patient is looking a lot worse, like, you know, needing to be intubated, like in the ICU, um, you may want to think about doing an exchange transfusion at the time. Yeah, it was explained to me in the past that, that acute chest is sort of like a spectrum. And fortunately, I've, I've seen a lot of patients on the milder end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And it seemed, I wasn't necessarily always even giving antibiotics to every single patient, but especially it's very mild. Like mm -hmm. They have an infiltrate, but they're pretty much asymptomatic otherwise. Right. But it seems like low threshold. So low threshold to, to, to start antibiotics, kind mm -hmm. of like community-acquired pneumonia treatment, exactly. it seems like. Exactly. And, and then uh, you mentioned transfusion. So simple versus exchange is kind of based on how sick they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and exchange transfusion, does that have to be, it seems like that would be more of an ICU or step down unit. Yeah. Thing, so not, um, um, if we think kind of about the simple and the exchange transfusions, there's like two different kinds, right? So simple transfusions, we do like all the time, I feel like on our patients, they sure. their hemoglobin's a little bit low, we give them one or two units of just like donor blood, and you don't need anything special, right, for mm -hmm. the for the simple transfusion. Exchange transfusions are a little bit more complex, right? Um, basically, what you're trying to do is remove like all that S hemoglobin and the sickle cell from the patient's body, and basically adding a brand new set of blood right to the patient you need to be at a specialized center so not all hospitals are going to be able to accommodate this uh, you need to have specialized equipment you need to have a special nurse that's trained in doing exchange transfusions um, and you need to have like a special venous catheter kind of like the ones that you do for dialysis um, in order to do an exchange transfusion so again if you're thinking that you might need to do an exchange transfusion on the patient you got to make sure to ask you know talk with hematology and say like is this something that we should be doing since the patient is getting worse, most of the time they'll probably agree with you and say yes. Um, and there are some guidelines in terms of like when to do simple versus exchange and things like that. All right, that's, that's helpful because this, this is a condition that I've always felt is kind of like a little bit of, because of that spectrum mm -hmm. aspect of it, it's a little bit of a gray area. Um, any other, um, actually let me stick with transfusions for a second. Mm -hmm. Is there a general transfusion threshold, like for our general medical patients, less than seven is where we yeah. start thinking about it. With, with sickle cell, do you have a lower threshold? It, um, because sometimes their baseline might be seven. So right. How do you handle that? Right. So um, we don't transfuse every single patient that comes in with sickle cell disease or basal occlusive crisis if they're coming into the hospital. Um, blood transfusions are not without risks, right? Like patients can have acute transfusion reactions or um, delayed uh, hemolytic transfusion reactions can be more common in patients with sickle cell disease. And this blew my mind that I saw that it could even like happen seven to 14 days after they got a transfusion, which is crazy, um, but that could be seen. And of course, we don't wanna transfuse people willy-nilly 
because there could be issues with iron overload and um, hyperviscosity, right, in the blood. And so, again, we're really trying to weigh the risks and the benefits of doing a, a transfusion in patients. Now, also, patients who've had chronic transfusions in the past are going to have more alloantibodies. Um, and so, sometimes it could be hard to find matching blood for patients, especially if they have a lot of antibodies in their blood. So, basically, if a patient is coming in and I feel like they need to have a transfusion, I'm going to go ahead and send off for that type of screen so I can make sure that they don't have too many antibodies or that I'm waiting a long time for their blood product. I think I had a patient that I waited for like seven days for blood oh to come, gosh. which is a really long time uh, just because they had so many antibodies in their blood. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something to really keep in mind. Um, I think kind of the thought in terms of like, when do you transfuse a patient who has sickle cell disease? Um, it's really based off of like consensus panel and like different guidelines have a little bit of a different idea of when to do a transfusion, simple versus exchange. Okay. And I think kind of the general kind of thought is if a patient is coming in and they're having kind of symptomatic anemia, um, that you would take a look at their hemoglobin, their baseline hemoglobin. And if you're about two grams, like less than your baseline, you may want to think about transfusing them. Um, again, we're thinking also about like iron overload and hyperviscosity right. syndrome. And so if they have issues with that, you know, again, you might want to hold off, but a kind of a two point difference from their baseline might be kind of a, a good thought. Um, and that really goes for things like symptomatic anemia or like aplastic anemia. Um, if the patient has like acute sequestration uh, from like their spleen, where their hemoglobin drops like acutely, you might want to think about doing a simple transfusion. And then um, kind of like mild acute chest, you might want to think about doing a simple transfusion. And the guidelines for mild are about one gram difference from their baseline. Yeah. Um, and so exchange transfusions, I think about patients who have like more acute complications. So moderate to severe acute chest, they have issues with acute stroke or um, priapism that's like not improving or multi-organ failure. Those are the times when I'm starting to reach for this you know, exchange transfusion for these patients. Now, there's also some data regarding patients who are coming in preoperatively um, that uh, need to have uh, general anesthesia and need to undergo um, surgery that they might do an exchange transfusion at the time because if they do surgery and go through general, general anesthesia, they're at higher risk for, for having acute complications. So you may want to kind of preemptively do kind of an exchange transfusion for those that population. And then also for pregnant people, which, you know, I don't really encounter a lot of pregnant patients um, kind of in our hospitalist group. but um, they could come along, and if they're having kind of fetal complications, that might be a time that you're thinking about doing an exchange. Yeah, so many of the things you you said uh, are terrifying. Adding <laughs> adding pregnancy really in awesome. on top of yeah. all those other things uh, really really would terrify me. So I think um, time wise, I don't know if we're gonna have time for audience questions or if we I don't know if we have any really pressing audience questions. Like we're that's close to the end of our case here. Fix the patient, talk about transitions, and see what we do in terms of time left. Sure. Okay. okay. So let's let's That's conclude our case. The patient, by the way, I'm with you guys dying. <laughs> We're such good doctors. <laughs> we we've done we've done great work. We've so done today. great work. The patient yeah. gets an exchange transfusion for her acute chest. Her symptoms stabilize. Her pain decreases. We wean the PCA. She switched back to her home medications. She's discharged to pop with her PCP and hematologist within seven to fourteen days. So that's when the discharge paperwork. I would love to hear from you how good transitions look and how you facilitate them and sort of where things can fall apart. Um, Cause I feel like this feels like a very potentially dangerous time for these patients. For sure. Um, again, I have the luxury of having this co-management service with one of our hematologists here that um, sees a lot of our sickle cell patients. So our transitions are relatively easy. Um, he sees the patients in the inpatient setting and he is going to see that patient in the outpatient, which is like ideal yeah, situation, right. right? And so he knows exactly what happened in the hospitalization, whether they got an exchange or, you know, whether they got a transfusion and how they did. Um, and he, he writes for all their opioids as well in terms of what they're going to transition to as an outpatient and we actually have um uh, kind of a kind of a case manager that works with him that basically sets up all of their outpatient appointments um, for for this particular hematologist. This sounds like an ideal situation. I, I, again, like this is like a dream situation for us, and it makes basically us a lot you're easier. bragging. Basically, <laughs> I'm just bragging, and you guys should all come work with me. Um, and so, 
for us, it's pretty easy, right? But I understand that not everyone's going to have that luxury. And so if you, um, ideally, what would happen if the patient is kind of transitioning out of the hospital is that we would send a message over to their hematologist and say, hey, I just want to let you know this patient was here in the hospital for X, Y, Z. I've written them for a kind of a three-day kind of short course of, you know, opioids because they've already run out. Um, it'd be great if you could see them within this time so that um, you can check and make sure that things are going well for them, that if they need extra opioids, that you're able to prescribe that for them, and then they can see them kind of long-term and follow up with them as an outpatient. That's great. I, I do think we should, maybe we can, we can stick around after if people want to, but I think we should just start to wrap up so that way sure. we're not keeping people late. Um, so if you, uh, you mean, if you wanted to give like one or two take-home points for the audience that they can remember from this, this great conversation we've had, um, next time they're seeing patients with sickle cell. Yeah, um, I think kind of thinking about like early triage and early administration of analgesia in the in the emergency room setting um, can really help prevent those inpatient admissions. Um, thinking about kind of those misconceptions that we have of patients with sickle cell disease and kind of opioid use disorder and really kind of believing their pain and treating their pain uh, accordingly in order to help prevent those kind of acute complications. Um, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm never like scared to consult my hematologist <laughs> if needed or consult really anybody because if I need help, like they're going to be able to help me, right? And so um, get your hematologist on board if needed. If you're worried about, you know, opioid dosing, you know, ask your friends um, in pain medicine or if you're mad, you don't have any friends, you can <laughs> call on. some of my friends <laughs> and they can, they can help you out. Um, and that's really it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, applause for our, our fantastic guests. And Paul, if you want to quickly record an outro. Yeah, sure. This is maybe the most humiliating part. You guys can just leave at this point. If you want. <laughs> <clears throat> this has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hall. Yummy. I, I was hoping someone would be brave, but <laughs> still hungry for more. Join our Patreon, get all of our episodes ad free, plus twice monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find our show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, including the Curbsiders Digest, which recaps the latest practice changing articles, guidelines, and news in the bonus. And we're committed to high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So you can email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. You can find the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere. Uh, a reminder that our episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Special thanks to Dr. Aaron Kim and the Department of Hospital Medicine for uh, inviting us and, and helping us have such a wonderful trip. And uh, to Dr. Yumi uh, for, for being with us today. And uh, our technical production is done by the team at Podpace. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, Paul, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. There's like real palpable panic there. And <laughs> as, as always, I mean, Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, thank you and goodbye. Okay, that's it. That's it. it was feeling on. <laughs>